has built up a bit. So we should be looking at a high of 22 degrees, which is decent enough compared to the 15 degrees we had a few days ago. That's really cold. But that aside, we are back again. Monday is myself. Tuesday is Aunt Sylvia with uh, Mindset Change. Wednesday, we have Anne Vachaita. Thursday, the indomitable Dr. Nelly. And then Friday, we have our business opportunities. And we're always glad to have all of you join us. Remember, these are also accessible on Facebook. Let me just head on to Facebook and see if I can uh, find the link. It's there and it's shareable. And so you can be able to share that to your colleagues and your friends. Now, today is particularly interesting for me because I also will be on an, on a podcast for East Asian. Uh, uh, in the, this is like some kind of leadership po uh, podcast, uh, courtesy of the African Entrepreneurial Network. So I'm on it at nine. That should be exciting and uh, it's very interesting. The person interviewing me is one of the leading um, uh, influencers out of India uh, in, in, in the space of motivation and uh, leadership as well as, uh, well, our space. So uh, that's exciting. So looking forward to it. There's some um, clips that were sent to me to share on social media. Never go around to share them. So I will share them when I have the link for that video. But things are exciting. And uh, again, this proves that what we do every day here on this platform isn't for nothing. There is always that door. There's always that somebody out there who watches, who follows, and they are able to do great things. Also, I'm very excited on a personal level. Uh, the first six months, Doc posed a very challenging question last week. She said, what have you been able to do? She spoke about her own uh, list and said that over 70% of our items are completed. Uh, frankly, mine is sitting at about 20%. So yesterday, something leapfrogged on the list. And so a really big development took place and that's going to see us moving by leaps and bounds. I look forward to that. Can't say much right now, but you will see from the signs within the next three or so months, there's something extremely significant that happened on Saturday and that itself is a lead and it'll push us to the next level. But straight away, without further ado, let me jump straight into the training for today. As you all know, those of you who've been following this, we have been looking at leadership. And uh, today I begin a very interesting series around leadership, just another change. Remember our studying misconceptions and uh, in terms of misconceptions, uh, there were some deep issues that uh, were tackled. And I remember asking all of you to take your own time and your own private time to answer some key questions. So what I want to do today now is I want to go into the next level. We are going to be looking at what are essentially good leadership principles, and we're going to take some time on that. And what better place to start than with the army, of course. And the jury may be out as to which is the most fearsome military force in the world, but I think the United States could really take the cream for that. And I won't get into details of what that army has or hasn't got, and certainly we'll avoid speaking about the rights and wrongs that were committed by them past or present. But one will have to agree that the US Army has been consistent as a formidable force to reckon with. And one cannot speak of such formidableness outside of leadership. And I'm not you know, speaking of political leadership, though that has massive impact depending on whether that leadership has some of these outlines, but military leadership. Now, it is in this slide that I now refer to a list shared by the United States website uh, for the army. And that's by literally Captain Ron Roberts. He did a series that he wrote called the 12 principles of modern uh, military leadership. I, for me, found that list absolutely profound. And, you know, it exemplifies why leadership for the military is the deciding factor between victory and defeat. And these principles are the differentiator and are a great place as a start when it comes to leadership and what difference that in itself can make. So, you know, um, 
I think it was not, I think it's uh, John Maxwell who said everything rises and falls on leadership. You, you can't run away from that. You know, uh, there's a saying in our uh, circles, a bad carpenter always blames his tool, a bad leader blames his people. Yeah, the truth of the matter is that you're the leader, you're the one in charge. And so the buck stops with you. You can't, you know, I've heard a, a statement, especially in, re in reference to the previous regime, and uh, again, I don't want to be political here, but you can't, you can't speak leadership and not touch on politics. It's almost impossible. I heard a lot of people saying that our former president is a good guy, but surrounded by bad people. Yeah, yeah. How can I put it? I think that's an oxymoron because anybody who's in leadership, anybody who heads any kind of organization, any kind of institution, whatever it might be, anywhere where leadership is required knows that a person attracts who he is comfortable with. A person surrounds themselves with people they are comfortable with. That's why the saying that birds of the same feather do what? Flock together. So you can't say ah, Rev Walter's a good guy, just that the people around him. How do those people get to me? It's because I am attracting who I am. I am surrounding myself, myself with who I am. And so it is the French General Napoleon who was credited for this quote. In fact, sorry, there's a quote, which I'm going to use. And uh, this particular quote is very appropriate. And I quote, a leader is a dealer in hope. Okay, indeed hope is what great leadership is about. Remember that great leaders possess these qualities among others, a great sense of vision and purpose, which is then determinedly pursued in such a way that it inspires others to give up what they have to follow that vision. In, it is a case of effectively communicating uh, a sense of purpose to such an extent that those who are inspired are willing to pay even the highest price of their own lives for that vision. So a great leader inspires. So if a leader has people and you're saying the leader is great, but the people around him are bad, that's a highly questionable statement. Remember, people are attracted to who they are or they're attracted to something they aspire to be. So leader, the reason why everything rises and falls on leadership is because of precisely that. Leadership is the differentiator. See any great company, you're looking at a great culture. Who do you think is the author of that culture? The leader. So every great company has a culture and that culture comes from its leadership. And leaders, great leaders who groom successors tend to groom people that have the same culture and inclination as themselves. So we can't say, oh, great guy lousy people around them because that is simply not true we attract who we are leaders surround with themselves with people they are comfortable with and as you know vision now let's go back to the whole issue of vision vision is always about an ideal or a state that is yet to become it's yet to become okay but is so clearly articulated by the leader that followers are ready to pour some or all of their resources including themselves into its realization that then means one must be a good dealer in hope because it is yet to become but requires resources that must come from those within the sphere of the leaders so great leaders are really good at that i mean think of jesus jesus literally went to all these guys, Peter, you know, in fact, Andrew was the first guy that ran into Pete, into Jesus. And then the apostle Andrew went and told Peter, hey, I found the Messiah, come and see. And then there was John and there was his brother James and their father Zebedee. Of course, Zebedee continued with the farm, with the business of, uh, of, 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 of the fishing, but they were really close to Jesus because Zebedee and his mom remember, I mean, and his wife, Remember, even had the audacity to ask Jesus, especially the mom to John and James, the sons of Sunder, whether he could allow the one to sit on the right. Now. So, so my point is, when Jesus went to see these people, he told them, come, follow me. Come, follow me. Matthew was a tax collector for crying out loud. That means he was doing extremely well. If you think about the disciples that Jesus had, Matthew was probably the richest besides Judas Iscariot, even though Judas Iscariot was a zealot. So I'm not too sure about his financial standing, but the fact that they picked him as, a, as, a, as an accountant meant he already had 
an inclination towards finance. So two of the wealthiest disciples, if you could use such a term, amongst Jesus were Matthew and James, I'm sorry, and uh, Judas. But yet, yet these two abandoned everything they were doing to follow Jesus. That's how powerful Jesus was a dealer in hope. So any leader who cannot communicate hope to his followers or her followers so that they're able to give up all their resources to follow that person, not a great leader. And so then the military now, so let's go back to the military. The military is one such place where people won't just expend time and effort as resources, but they will also expend the most valuable resource, which is life and limb, life and limb, literally. Few are willing to expend such for a bad leader, okay? So if the leader is bad, followers will not be willing to die for them. And that is why generals and the rank and file makes the difference between victory and defeat. Indeed, everything rises and falls on leadership. So let's begin with number one. So there are quite a number of principles. I will share what I can today and then we'll build it next week and the week after until we're done with these 12 military leadership principles. And, and, and I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, those of you who are following me on Facebook, as well as those on uh, Zoom, these are killer principles. You will be so blessed to understand these. And if you can hold, hold that, <laughs> you really see a big difference for yourself. You will be so, so blessed uh, by this. So let's begin with the first principle. So you can get your pen and paper. Let's start writing. Number one, lead from the front. Lead from the front. And I really, you know, I really like that one. Lead from the front. What, what does leading from the front mean? Let me, let me show you a picture. I'm going to show you a picture that I think, no, it can't fit. I would have showed you, but it can't fit. It would have been great to show you this picture. So, Huh. In this picture, okay, you know what, this picture speaks too much, so I, I just have to find a way to show you. So hold on, I'm going to show you this picture. Okay, there we are. It's not perfect, but it's good enough. This, this is going to hit home. I think this picture says everything, uh, and a lot of people get it wrong. That's why they don't get it right. Have you seen this picture here? There's the boss. He's sitting, here's his mission, and these are the followers. So he's at the back barking out orders and pushing these people to carry the mission. But here's the leader. Have you seen that? The mission is behind and he is at the front. She is at the front and all the people are behind the leader. Are you seeing that difference? For me, that speaks volumes, volumes about what I'm saying. So let's, let's, let's build into this. So the first one, like I said, is leaders lead from the front. So there is no better way to lead than from the front. The greatest leaders in history all led from the front and at the heat of the battle. Classic examples would include, of course, the, from the Bible, King David, whom whilst in a situation where all were stuck and literally dying of thirst, made a wish that he could drink water from a particular well in enemy territory, well, in their territory, enemy territory, but three brave men from his, um, his inner circle braved the odds and did the impossible by venturing into enemy territory, risking life and limb to get that water, which they then brought back from their leader, who upon seeing and realizing the odds these men went through, chose to offer that water to God and continue thirsting with his men. It is such gallantry that wins men's hearts and souls. Recent examples, of course, would include the president of Ukraine, Zelensky, you know, who had an opportunity to leave at the heat of battle and yet chose to remain behind with his people and brave the odds and the full-fledged fury and invasion of the Russians. He has even been pictured at the heart of Kiev and other battle ravaged fronts, encouraging soldiers and civilians alike to take up arms and stand against this aggression. Like or hate the reasons for the war, this is a great display of leadership and the concept of leading from the front. And, I, and, and for me, that one, ladies and gentlemen, is everything. You know, um, there's another saying, very powerful, very similar to lead from the front, which states, and I quote, 
leaders eat last. I've said it last time. That's the one I close with. Today, I am opening with it. Leaders eat last. I will say this 100 times. If you're a boss, if you are running a company, if you run some place and you choose to pay yourself first rather than pay your people because you're the boss and the owner, then truly you are not a leader. You're a boss. If you can be living in opulent luxury, knowing very well that there are people that are under your charge and care who haven't even received their payment, you're not a leader, you're a boss. In short, you're selfish. In short, you're not willing to die for the people that follow you. And when you're at such a level, to be perfectly honest, no one is going to really work for you. Many of them are just going to be, what's the word? Mercenaries, hirelings. They'll be there just for the money. So as soon as the money is better elsewhere, they're gone. One of my, one of, one of the most uh, interesting examples I saw uh, of this concept displayed is an uncle of mine. Uh, I think I can no yeah I, I think I can mention his name I I'm not supposed to I didn't I didn't I never asked him uh, but 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 I think it's a great example. My uncle Uncle Max Titula many many years ago was running he was one of the initiators of a, of, a, of an organization called Zaksimba Zambia Chamber of Small and Medium Business Associations many many years ago I'm talking about maybe 15 17 years ago when he was just starting he was the architect behind putting it together remember that's supposed to be an affiliate to Zaki which is the Zambia uh, Chamber of Commerce and Industry so Zaksimba kind of was used to help deal with the micro and and, and small businesses that would then be connected through something called uh, district business associations. I don't know how they're doing nowadays, but back in the day, that's how it used to be. Now, when Uncle Max started this organization, he got some of the best people. A lot of the people that he worked with in those days, I'm telling you, are top flyers and top executives today running very influential institutions and organizations. I know for a fact because many of them were working with him. Now, there was a time when uh, USAID, if I'm not wrong, had finished their obligated contract and were no longer funding and it was supposed to be picked up by Ministry of Commerce and uh, Trade and Industry and then become a baby of the government and then of course using the format of uh, fees coming through the various uh, affiliates would be able to run itself but the truth of the matter is when all this was put together there just wasn't enough money to run that administration that was there. Now Uncle Max realizing the situation that they were in had uh, come to Jesus talk with the whole staff. I think there were about seven or six back in the day. And he told them, guys, this is our situation. We're supposed to be receiving funding from um, you know, our cooperating partners. But at the moment, we have absolutely no funding whatsoever. And so as it is, this organization has nothing. And I'm giving you guys permission. Those of you who want to exit, you can exit. Uh, but those of you who want to stay on, stay on. I know this thing will turn around, but I just don't know when it will turn around. Do you know, I mean, I saw this for myself. Do you know, not a single one of those professionals, and these were professionals. This, this wasn't just ordinary. These were qualified professionals who could easily have jumped ship and gone elsewhere. Maybe you could tell me, nah, there were no jobs. Yeah, fine, there were no jobs. There's never jobs anyway. But the truth is that those seven professionals, including Uncle Max, stayed on. No one left. They attended every day that they could. They did what they could. And here's what really blew me away. Six months, not a single one of those people left. Six months. Seventh month, they had their breakthrough and a funder came through. I think USAID, GTZ, whoever. All these cooperating cup partners then came through and now they had funds and they were able to pay all the salaries in arrears and take Zach Simba to the next level. Uncle Max left Zach Simba very well set up for the next person that took over. But what I admired, for me, what really hit home was his leadership. You know, nobody jumped ship. You know, people believed so much in Uncle Max, they were able to stay on with that man. That man never took a salary either. Because even when there were opportunities for him to be paid, he chose, there were times that money would come. I remember this, money would come for per diem for his attendance. He would get his own money for per diem from attending an event outside Zambia. He would bring that money, pass it on to the accountant and say, let the institution owe me. Please give allowances to everybody from my money. Just put it as a credit note. Now, that, my friend, is leadership. 
How many people do you think would be willing? Then here's where things got really interesting. Two, three other officers would get opportunities for per diems. Do you know that they actually started emulating what he was doing? And when they would come, they would also share their per diem. Until when the funding came on the seventh month, everybody was refunded to the full. But it was because my uncle set the tone. And this is what I want to share really very, very passionately with every one of you watching today. Many of you are not able to retain good staff because of your own attitude. You don't make a great inspiring leader. When, when, when it comes to the, when crux comes to the crunch, you're not in the trenches with your people. You'd rather sit from your high ivory tower and bark out orders to people. And when all the benefits come in, you're the first that's seen to be eating everything before your people. I assure you, you push such a culture no one will care about the organization. They will look out for their own skins because they know that you don't care. But when they know you care as a leader, it changes everything. When they know you're willing to sacrifice, when they know you're willing to be in the trenches with your people for the sake of whatever your vision is, that's a differentiator. So let's quickly go to the second one. I think I'll close with the second one. So the first one is lead from the front. The second one is have self, maybe three, I'll do three. So have self-confidence, not egoism. By the way, there's a very diff big difference between self-confidence and egoism. Uh, George, General George uh, Patton said, and I quote, as I gain in experience, I do not think more of myself, but less of others. Have you seen that? As I gain in experience, I do not think more of myself, but less of others. But what I do is think less of myself and more of others. That's basically what this man is saying, okay? There is a very thin line, by the way, between being an egotistical, um, uh, you know, twerp and a self-confident person. Very thin line. Everything. In fact, for a lot of people, it can almost be a mistaken for arrogance. Eh? But then one has to realize that people tend to follow those that know where they're going, even if it's straight into a pit. And as the saying goes, the world always makes room for those who know where they are going. So it's therefore imperative, you know, that, you know, one thing that must be present in all leaders is a high sense of self-confidence. And this, of course, does not mean one does not regard others, you get it? But then it is imperative that they exude confidence in what they do and what they express to those whom they lead. If this is missing, it is very unlikely that this will inspire confidence in those who are being tasked to lead. Remember, the leader must show they know what they're doing. So even if the leader doesn't know what's going on, they have to show that they know. Even if the leader has moments of doubt, they must show they do not doubt. You cannot, let me tell you, I know in this day and age with all this being in touch with your feminine side, you should show your weakness and cry. But let me tell you, not when you're inspiring people, not when people are putting their lives at stake, not when people are putting their heart and soul into what you're doing. You cannot afford to look weak because when you do so, my friend, that's the end of your organization. And I mean it. You can't look weak. Even if things are looking bad, you must put a face of courage. And that's why self-confidence is very important. Now, some people say, well, that's being a hypocrite. Well, it's not being a hypocrite. You're a leader. To him whom much is given, much is required. Leadership requires that you put up a, a, a face of hope. Remember, leaders are what? Dealers in hope. That's the words of Napoleon. Leaders are dealers in hope. Hope means you are looking forward to something that's not yet there. You can't go there and start breaking down. And this is where even for, if you're the man in the family, right? And, you know, children are there and everything. You can't be in front of your kids. <laughs> You cannot do that in front of your kids. What's wrong with you? Be a man. Now I know, again, you see, that's why it's so funny because I know that there's this whole thing about, no, men don't cry. I think my good man, uh, what's his name? Uh, Abel Chungu did a song even uh, called Amuna Samalila. Yeah, true, Amuna Samalila. Uh, that, that, that could be true. But you know what? There are instances where, let us be very honest, 
you cannot afford to demonstrate that weakness. You cannot afford to, to come in there and look weak because if you do so, my friend, that's how you are gonna mess up the whole situation. So the whole situation requires that you show a lot of confidence um, and, and exude that state of knowing what's going on. So remember, it's not egotism, but it's confidence. Have self-confidence. Let me end with the last one, moral courage. Now, moral courage is a very tough one. In fact, maybe I should stop here because moral courage is, is a full topic. That one, that one, I'm telling you, a lot of our leaders, they really fail big time on moral courage because, you know, they, they don't have they don't have that means. Uh huh. There's and uh, Dr. Nelly even saying this goes to even helpers at home. Yeah, don't go and show helpers that you don't have money. And then, by the way, this also means people who are getting paid. If a helper is in your home, you don't have a situation. You don't want a situation where the helper sees you buying all the shopping, but you're telling them that ribbon drama. That's not gonna cut it. They will know you're eating alone. So let me close with this point on leadership and specifically on the second point we were dealing with, which is self-confidence. Show a face of strength, show a face of confidence because people are gonna be looking up to you and they expect you to have the answers. So don't show weakness in that situation. Uh, I hope I won't bring this up as an example again, but you know, one of my favorite movies is Saving Private Ryan. In Saving Private Ryan, there's a scene that I find very, very moving. In that scene, I'll mention this several times, but it's a very good scene. Uh, captain, I've forgotten his name, but there was a captain who, who Tom Hanks, the character Tom Hanks plays, is leading eight men to go look for this guy called Ryan. Ryan loses four of his brothers in a war, and, or is it three? And so the, 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 the general, I think General Patton, said, nope, he's not going to be allowed to fight. Let him go home. He should be taken home. He's earned his ticket to go home. So a special crack unit is sent to go look for Ryan deep in enemy territory and bring the guy back home. So somewhere along the way, they are walking and they come across this area where there's snipers shooting. And uh, what happens to these snipers? They realize they are snipers and these guys are going to be killing many people. So the captain has to make a very tough decision. The people that are for the captain told him, and this is a really relevant story. Listen to this. The people told the captain, it's not our mission. Our mission is to rescue Ryan. Let another unit coming behind come and deal with these snipers. The captain says, if we leave these snipers, they will kill more of our people. And we are here. We've got the weapons. We've got everything. Let's divert. Let's go sort out this. And it was a really heated argument, but he pulled rank. I'm captain. You follow my orders. Let's do it. So they do it right. And, and, and one of them kept saying, I have a really bad feeling about this. Then somebody else told him, everybody has a bad feeling about these. We're in war. There's always a bad feeling. So they go in there. Sure enough, they finish the whole thing. Unfortunately, one of their guys gets shot and dies. A very, very sad, very moving scene. He dies. So when he dies, there's an order. Okay, let's bury the guy. I let they capture the enemy. And then as they're doing that whole process of burying the guy and capturing the enemy, the captain leaves the place. He says, finish off what you're doing. He leaves the place and goes behind where no one is seen. And there behind the captain whips bitterly. Bitterly whips, but quietly. I mean, it's one of the most moving scenes I've ever seen Tom Hanks do. Very bitter. He really wept from the heart, but not loud. And then, you know, but he has to keep looking behind to see if any of his men are seeing. He wipes his tears and everything, composes himself and goes back. And they continue as if nothing happens. But we who watch the movie know that that broke the captain. You know, he made a decision and that decision costed the life of one of his good medic men. It hurt him badly, but he's a captain. He's a leader. He had to put up a face and he had to go in there and exude confidence for the sake of his men. He made a decision, it was wrong, but he stood by it. And that's what I want to end this session with for every one of you here. You must learn that there, you're gonna make mistakes as a leader. You're gonna make bad calls. There's gonna be times things will go wrong, but it doesn't mean you lose your confidence. And even if it means breaking down, break down elsewhere. Do not break down in front of your children. Do not break down in front of your wife, unless it's crying for your child, of course. But where people are looking for confidence, people are looking for assurance, people are looking for hope from you, you must show hope. 
even when you feel discouraged. How many times did Moses say, I'm done. These people, these are your people, these are your people. They are so hard, but I'm going to stand with them. And there are times that God tested Moses to see if he's resolved with leading the children of Israel. And every time Moses stood for his people. Moses, you know, the most powerful statement, I'll close with this. Leading from the front, Moses' statement to God. Listen to what God said. I, these stiff-necked people, I am going to destroy all of them in the desert and I'll build a new nation through you. I will block, I will build a new nation through you. Then you know what Moses says? Be it far from you, God, that you would do such a horrible thing and all the enemies hear about it. If you're going to proceed with this, then start with me. Get rid of me too, and then everyone else. Now that, my friends, is leading from the front. You imagine Moses daring God, saying, if you're going to destroy all these people, then you might as well destroy me as well. Because there's no way I'm going to go. You gave me these people to lead. I'm leading them. Yes, they are pain in the back, pain in the neck, but I'm leading them nonetheless. And then you want to destroy the people and leave me? That's not your character, Lord. If you're going to do it, then get me also going. Start with me. Get rid of me first. Then get rid of the people. Now that's powerful. You know that God relented? I mean, that's profound. So ask yourself a question as I close. How many of you here, how many of you here are willing to put yourself and your life on the line for your people? If you've got people that you're leading, how many of you are willing to die for them? That to die means choosing to deny yourself so that the people you're leading are able to benefit. I'll leave that with you. That's a powerful, powerful statement for you to think about. And I hope that as we teach this point on leadership, many of you will be able to gain from this and learn that true leadership is about willing to sacrifice self. That's why I kept saying, True leaders eat last. Good leaders eat last. And remember, exude confidence. Don't show weakness in front of your subordinates who are looking up to you. Because if they are looking up to you, it means you deal in hope. And if they're dealing in hope, you cannot be hopeless as a leader. That is the worst characteristic trait you could ever possess. Have a great day. And tomorrow, uh, Dr. Nelly will be here to take us through the next session. Cheerio.